Right, hello everyone. <clears throat> uh, yes, uh, so I don't have slides today. It's just you and me. Like a man locked in a shipping container with an ailing tiger. Um, I'm afraid that's where my voice is as well. I, I've been roaring quite a lot this week, uh, but I won't be doing any roaring today. So, I'm Nate Crowley. I'm a sci-fi and horror author. Uh, I'm also writing a game at the moment called Big Mike Lunchtime's Business Training 95. Um, <laughs> And <clears throat> you may also have recently come across me. Um, I've gotten a pickle, uh, a bit of a pickle on Twitter where I'm Frog Croakley. Um, I'm stuck in a, an unending fundraising adventure um, to invent fictional games. I'm up to number 420 something as of today. I need to get into the 800s. So uh, do check out my uh, Twitter, Frog Croakley, and maybe uh, give some money to a conservation charity uh, to force my brain into meltdown. So, uh, my thesis today uh, is that games uh, have some pretty unique options in the way they can portray elements of the horrible, and that this has nothing at all to do with the horror genre, uh, and that it may in fact be by accident in games that have nothing to do with the horror genre. So let me first start out by differentiating horror as a genre and the horrible um, as, as a sort of a, an ideological concept. So. Um, to do so, I want to use the example of Fiendish Feet. Uh, Fiendish Feet, for those uh, avid yogurt consumers uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, were a range of yogurts by Dairy Giant St. Ival, which had the twin themes of hammer horror monsters and feet. Um, the pots had sort of monster faces on and feet. Um, they were quite good yogurts, but they're also, to me, emblematic of how... Um, horror can exist as a genre completely defanged and devenomed. You know, Dracula, when he's leering off a yogurt pot, is not the same as Nosferatu. You know, they are at opposite, spe uh, opposite sides of the spectrum when it comes to vampires in, in, in horror. But it's still a horror trope. You know, Frankenstein, Wolfman, Dracula, Mummy, they're horror things, but they're not always horrifying. They don't always pertain to the horrible as a concept. So, sometimes it's the opposite. Um, was watching playthrough recently of a, a, I think it was a PS2 game called <clears throat> Clive Barker's Jericho. Um, the cough isn't part of the title, but that game is, it's full of hollow stirrings. There's viscera um, everywhere, piles of slick guts, an ancient city returned full of horrors, and uh, a team of warrior magicians uh, sent in a black helicopter to sort it out. Uh, but for all the game tries, to laden itself down with the trappings of horror. There's nothing horrible about it. You're surrounded by burly, wisecracking soldiers um, vomiting an unending stream of lead into the ghouls attacking you, and nothing ever really feels that disconcerting. So, you can have horrible without horror. You can have horror without horrible. We're, we're clear on that. Um, so, this is where it gets really interesting. In games, sometimes we have horror where it is unexpected. Um, in where we're, we're not dealing with the horror genre. And this takes us back to Freud's idea of the unheimlich um, from his 1919 essay of the same name. It's a great concept, also called The Uncanny. You might know it from The, the Uncanny Valley. Is that, that that's the thing everyone's familiar with? So, like, when you have um, a representation of a human figure, it starts off being fairly pleasing and recognisable, a stick man. And then you've got, you know, a photograph of a person here. And then here you've got Peter Cushing... Uh, from Rogue One. You know, it's a sort of eerie, waxy being. And this is the idea, the closer something is to the familiar, but where there is a discernible difference, the more uncanny and unsettling it is. So let's look at some examples of that in games. Um, who's played Sonic 2? <laughs> Mystic Cave Zone. That bit. The Spike Pit. Yeah, okay, I'm getting some hisses of recognition. Now, Sonic is forgiving, okay? Um, that sounds like I'm a preacher. I, uh, <laughs> I want to tell you the truth about Knuckles. Uh, no, um, Sonic is very forgiving. You can fall into lava and come out okay, okay? You know, it lets you get a right bee sting from an angry crab, and then you can walk away from that. Suddenly, this one part of Sonic 2, you can fall into a spike pit and you just can't get out. It takes your rings away, you can collect them up again, it takes what you've got left away, and eventually you realise, oh no, I'm going to die here. 
and you just have to give up. And it's okay, you feel cheated because it's a game that's very safe with you the rest of the time. And that's, I would say, a moment of the horrible. Um, Tasmania, another Sega game from the same period, um, based on the cartoon of the same name about the Tasmanian devil. Um, had this really good idea that they were going to have procedurally generated sound. So like in a cartoon, if someone runs off the edge of a cliff and looks down to realize nothing beneath them, there's like a doodle 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 noise while they look sort of sad. Um, so the game tried to have musical cues generated by what Taz was doing, whether he was ramming a spider into his mouth or leaping or coming across a truck in the desert. Unfortunately, this led to a game which was just an eerie, howling silence punctuated by random blasts of ugly MIDI noise. It was a bleak, inhuman soundscape um, and made the whole game feel profoundly alienating on a cosmic level. I really do recommend playing it just to experience that. Um, Dwarf Fortress, uh, one of the deepest simulations ever created. And because it's so deep, every time it's updated, some tiny change has a butterfly wing effect that just wrecks entire swathes of the game. Uh, in 2008, carp were put into the game. Inoffensive river fish. Uh, but because in the code they're roughly the same size as a dwarf, and their strength leveled up when they swam. So they got stronger and stronger just by swimming. So the game became full of these, like, just river brutes that would, like, beach themselves to annihilate anything that walked near them. The whole game became a carp avoidance simulator. It was really tense. I love that. Completely unexpected. But it became survival horror with cyprinids. Um, and then, of course, if we want to get back to the Uncanny Valley, uh, sporting games. Uh, because, obviously, they try to replicate human beings very realistically. And their glitches are horrendous. Uh, there's a Pro Evolution soccer gif, which is one of my favorites, where a, player, a, like a pixel in a player's face seems to anchor itself in space-time, and then the rest of him folds around it until he disappears into a sort of a hell of polygons. It's absolutely horrifying, and that's classic uncanny stuff. Um, but then, for some reason, this is really fun to play with. I don't know if any of you ever had a game genie, uh, but while it was good for getting extra lives and stuff, it was more fun just to fuck the code and see what came out. Um, you may have seen uh, a series on YouTube called uh, Monster Factory. Um, it's done by Polygon, which is just all about the sheer fun of creating like unwatchable characters using like the character generation slider systems in role-playing games. You know, they're, they're at once hideous and beautiful. Um, it's, it's a wonderful thing, and I want to, as a, the greatest example of unintentional horror in games, actually refer to another uh, Polygon series that's very popular at the moment, Carboys. Um, any fans of Carboys here? Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, so obviously that, that came up with one of the best characters I've come across this year in Busto. Um, the game is, uh, uh, they're playing a game called BeamNG.Drive, catchy. Um, <laughs> which is ostensibly a sort of a, a very, very, very detailed and realistic physics simulator for cars. What it is really played as, as they say, is a, a vehicular body horror simulator. Because um, you feel bad for the cars, and what they do in this series is just sort of crush them and destroy them in various inventive ways. But then someone made a mod with a crash test dummy, which is like an icon of the Unheimlich in itself. Um, they refer to it as Busto and begin to crush it, but it doesn't react like the cars. It doesn't crush normally. It turns into a sort of shimmering morass of what they refer to as God trash that then gets stretched out and expands to fill the entire game. As the boys continue to play, they begin to fear Busto. They begin to see the game as adversarial. And this is something we've all experienced. We've all said, oh, the game is really fucking with me today. It's got it out for me. This game hates me. We begin to see the game as adversarial. We become afraid of our own personal bustos. Um, and <laughs> this, is, this is kind of the point I'm getting to. And it takes us back to another Freudian concept of parapraxis, which is the Freudian slip. Uh, it's the revelation of a, a hidden desire or anxiety uh, through an error. And if you want to look, if you're seeing a game as adversarial, if there's a huge, massive moment of glitching that reveals completely unexpected areas of its source code in a way that's disconcerting, that's kind of an act of, of simulated parapraxis. So you could see it as that. You know, it's the game letting loose something frightening through a gap in its function. It's the carp in Dwarf Fortress. It's the silences in Tasmania. And I think that's a fascinating kind of horror. And my concluding point is the one thing that draws all of these examples together, all of the things 
uh, I've talked about today has something that um, Clive Barker's Jericho doesn't have, um, or indeed you know, a lot of other sort of media. Uh, think of the Saw movies, you know, they're just sort of sadism and violence. There's no humor in it. All of these examples are scary and funny at the same time. I think that's very interesting. The uncanny provokes us to laugh, and it's not entirely comfortable laughter. There's a connection, I think, between humor and fear, uh, and laughter is a very reasonable reaction in the face of the incomprehensible. Uh, and on that note, Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs>